it is heavy on second and third day with clots there is no pain and she has never taken any treatment for this so with this complaint she has come to me as i said she is go married for 7 years she is not able to and see though she is not using any contraceptive and she wants to have a child so here the 37 years old lady she has come to you main complaints is swelling over the abdomen second excessive bleeding during periods that is menorrhagia and third she is not able to conceive though she wants to. so with this complaint this patient has come to you so what you do you examine her and on general examination you find that she is has got pallor then you come to the abdominal exam examination so what you find in the abdominal examination if there is a large it's smooth mass hello so what you are finding is that on examination there is a large mass a firm mass is palpable which is corresponding to about 32 weeks of pregnancy so she is not pregnant but the mass is comparable to 32 weeks of pregnancy so you palpate it so you find a mass which is arising from the pelvis reaching up to the upper upper this is midway between the umbilicus and the zygomatic sternum which corresponds to 32 weeks if you press it there is no pain and if you try to move it it is more but if you do try to find out fluctuation there is no fluctuation it is firm and you are not able to palpate what is behind the mass so next after the abdominal examination what you do is the vaginal examination to you put a speculum and what you find the vagina is normal but you are not able to locate the where is the cervix you are not able to see the cervix and once you do a bimanual examination then you find there is a mass which is covering filling up the whole of the pelvis this mass is non tender firm it may be regular it may be thick but this is occupying the whole of the pelvis so this is what you find in the examination we send for the investigations so what you will find in the investigations hemoglobin so hemoglobin normal hemoglobin is should be more than 11 grams but here if you see the so the hemoglobin is 6.3 grams that means patient is anemic severely anemic why because she had been passing heavy bleeding during her periods then you see in the hemogram the mean corpuscular volume what is the size of the corpus uh, that uh, rbc so you find it is 68 femtoliter fl stands for femtoliter so what is the normal size of the rbc it is about 80 to 90 femtoliter but here it is 68 that means the size of the uh, rbc is much smaller so this is microcytic what when this happens microcytic and in which anemia this happens when there is a shortage of iron so this is iron deficiency anemia hemoglobin is just 6.3 what about wbc you see it is 4.9 thoms normally is from 4.5 to about 10000 isn't it per deciliter so the rbc count is uh, sorry wbc count is normal but what about platelet platelet is about 2.67 lakhs so what is the normal normal is from 1.5 to 4.5 but here it is 2.6 so platelet count is also normal wbc is also normal but hemoglobin is less the size of the rbc is less. so this is what you find. so you send the patient for the what other investigation the most important investigation in this case is ultrasonography so ultrasonography is done and it confirms that patient is having a large uterine fibroid this is causing and this fibroid is causing number one menorrhagia secondly it is causing anemia iron deficiency anemia and most probably this may be responsible that she is not able to conceive this is responsible for the infertility history 
So now let's discuss something about fibroid uterus. So what is fibroid? So the fibroid is the is the commonest benign tumor of the uterus. And from where it arises, fibroid? This arises from the smooth muscle cells of the uterus or it can arise from the smooth muscles of the blood, blood vessels which is supplying them. So two things, either smooth muscles of the uterus or smooth muscles of the blood vessels which is supplying them. So, and that's why since it is comes from the smooth muscles, so myoma, which is also known as leomyoma. Myoma means tumor of the muscles and leo means from the smooth muscles. So this is the tumor of the smooth muscles. So this is also known as leomyoma. What are the other names for the fibroid uterus? The fibromyoma, leomyoma, myoma. So myoma, I said, is the tumor of the muscles. So it is also known as myoma. Leomyoma, if it is from the smooth muscles, which so is also known as leomyoma. Some people also call it as fibromyoma or fibroleomyoma because it contains the fibrous tissue also. So this is also known as fibroma. So there are different names, fibroid uterus, myoma, leomyoma, fibromyoma, fibroleomyoma. So these are the different names for the same condition. So what is the incidence? How frequently this occurs? So this is one of the very common benign tumor of the uterus. So the incidence is about 20% in the reproductive age group. This you should remember. This is not for the all the women, but it is in the reproductive age group. That means from meno menarche to the menopause. If you take this two, then in this time it is 20%. That means the at least one woman out of five women are having this problem of fibroid uterus, which is a very common. So, like in this case, this woman has come with a lump abdomen, the large swelling, which is because of the lump or the mass in the abdomen. So, what are the other differential diagnoses when such a patient comes to you? I'll tell you one instance. Once I was called by a surgeon to examine a woman. This woman had lump abdomen or the mass abdomen and she had was complaining of pain. So after the surgeon has seen, so she he called me since she was a woman. So when I ex examined, so before any examination, all the gynecologists, what they do, they always ask the patient to go and pass urine because if you have not, she has not passed urine, you are not able to palpate the uterus correctly. So that's why this is the routine. All gynecologists they will ask the patient to go and pass urine. So I also ask that patient go and pass urine. So after the patient has come after passing urine, then I was not able to palpate the mass. And same way, I called the surgeon to please show me where is that mass which we are mentioning. He also came and he also could not find. So. What he had seen basically was a full blood. So you must always remember if the patient comes with a lump abdomen, pain abdomen, maybe both combined, not combined. So you must always exclude is a full blood. So the differential diagnosis, one thing is a full blood. That should be avoided. Number second, in another case, what had happened? A patient, a girl about 16 to 17 years age, unmarried girl, she had come to the casualty with pain abdomen. And the casualty medical officer, he saw, he found a lump abdomen, mass in the abdomen and patient was sh howling, shouting with pain. So he could not make out what it is. So he patient, he admitted her in ICU. Now this was done somewhere around 7 or 7.30 in the morning. So by... 8, 8.30, I went to the hospital. Then I was, I got a call from the ICU to please come uh, fast. He said, what happened? He said, the patient is delivering. So that was an unmarried teenage girl. So the another differential diagnosis is 
pregnancy. So always exclude pregnancy. Girl or the woman may be pregnant, may not be, sorry, may be married, may be unmarried. It doesn't make, doesn't make any difference if she is in the reproductive age group. Please exclude pregnancy. So in the differential diagnosis, first is exclude full bladder, exclude pregnancy. The other thing which sometimes happens is because there is an obstruction to the outflow of the menstrual blood. Okay, so that keeps on getting collected, maybe because of any fibrosis or because of the uh, imperforate hymen, hymen, anything, there is an obstruction so that the menstrual uh, blood is not able to flow out. So that keeps on getting collected inside the uterus and that keeps on increasing. So it, the other cause can be because of the because of the hematometer, that means collection of blood inside the uterus. Symmetrometer and suppose this gets infected, so it becomes a pyometer. The other not very common causes and where the size are smaller is a adenomyosis, there may be endometriosis, there may be ectopic pregnancy or on the side there may be tubo ovarian mass. Or the malignancy can also give, but not of this big size normally. So what are the, the malignancy of the endometrium? what is known as endometrial carcinoma in the wall of the uterus that is uterine sarcoma or the on the side of the uterus the ovaries may have a malignancy that is ovarian hematocrasis. So these are not very common. So the commonest as I said is the uterine fibroid followed by pregnancy but exclude full bladder and other is hematometra of the So, whether this fibroid, this is a hormone dependent or not, as I said initially, this is seen in the reproductive age group. That means it is not seen before menarche. And what happens after menopause? It doesn't come after menopause, but if the patient is already having fibroid, so that may continue after the menopause. That means the size may be affected. But it does not de novo comes after the menopause. So it is since it is only during the reproductive age group. So this is hormone dependent, and mainly the hormone which is responsible for this fibroid is estrogen. So this is an estrogen dependent tumor. The other hormones have also been implicated, though they are not very important, like growth hormone or placent human placental lactogen. So, what are the conditions when there is an excess of this estrogen? So, normally you may find this fibroid in case of nulliparity or less parity. Who has got one child and not conceiving or not having no child? So, those persons who have got um, uh, this history of nulliparity, etc., they are having an excessive estrogen and they are more liable to develop this. Other is obese patient, they are more liable to have this. Other is polycystic ovarian syndrome. In that condition also, there is an excess of estrogen and endometrial hyperplasia. Because of the effect of estrogen, the endometrium of the uterus that becomes hyperplastic. So in all these conditions, chances of developing uh, fibroid are much more. So now let's come to the anatomy and pathology of fibroid. So as I said initially, this develops from the smooth muscle cells. These muscle cells can be smooth muscle cells can be of the uterus. And or of the vessels which are and how they look like. These are normally well circumscribed. Okay. If you touch them, they are firm. They are normally round or oval. And the important thing about in this case is they have got a, not the capsule, but it has got a pseudo capsule because the tissues around this tumor, they get compressed and they give an impression that it is a capsule, but it is not a capsule. It is basically compression of the surrounding cells. So they have got a pseudo capsule, which is very important. The pseudo capsule during the surgery, as I said, they are normally firm, but sometimes they become very soft and cyst-like and cyst-like and cystic. 
when if the degeneration takes place inside these four things. And the other thing is, they may be single fibroid or there may be multiple fibroids. So number of times when you open up, there will be so many of the fibroids are there. Plus, there may be seeds of the fibroids all over. So the thing, if you treat one, uh, suppose there is a large leg in this case, say there is a big fibroid. You have removed this fibroid. But it doesn't mean that she will not have this problem again because there are a number of seedlings. So, you, so the fibroid can be either single or there can be multiple. So this fibroid from where you will find them, they can you can find them either in the body of the uterus or in the cervix. The commonest is in the body of the uterus. It, if you take 100 of this, to 80% of the fibroids are in the body of the uterus, and only 20% of the fibroids are found in this surface. And the blood, and the blood supply to this fibroid, the blood vessels comes and this goes under the zero capsule. So around the fibroid, the blood vessels are there, and from those circumferential blood vessels, the radial blood vessels goes inside. So the maximum blood supply is around on the surface of the fibroid and minimum blood supply is in the center. So the, in the center, the least amount of blood supply comes. So those innermost part, they are more likely to undergo degeneration as compared to the opposites. And if you cut this fibroid, you will find it has got a hold appearance. What is hold appearance? It is basically concentric sort of a thing like a circle-like thing inside the fat. So that is what is known as whole appearance. So if you cut it, you will see it like that. So how you classify anatomically, how you classify the fibroid or the myomas? So as I said, it depends upon the location. So it can be in the body of the uterus. If you, as I said, most of the fibroid are in the body of the uterus and less amount, less frequency over in the cervix. So in the body of the uterus, the fibroid, they may be present in the muscle, in the musculature of the, of the uterus or it may be towards the endometrium. That means towards the cavity or it may be towards the surface outside under the serosa. So they are further divided in where is their location. It may be subserosal. Subserosal means the fibroid is on the surface. Intramural, when the, it is in the real musculature of the uterus. So this is known as intramural. Subserosal, when it is towards the endometrial. So, sorry, submucosal, when it is towards the endometrial cavity. And that is what is a mucosa sort of a thing. Then this is known as submucosal. Submucosal, Intramural subsurface. This is in case of body of the uterus. And if it is in the cervix, then what happens? It may be either in the front or it is in the middle or it is in the behind. So the fibroid cervical myomas, they can be anterior cervical myomas, they may be posterior or they are may be central. There is a third type of location can be there of this myomas or fibroids. What is known as broad ligament myomas. So on the side of the uterus, there is a broad ligament. Okay. So if that is located in the broad ligament, then they are known as broad ligament myomas. There are two types of broad ligament myomas. One is a true, other is a pseudo or false. In true, the fibroid is originating from the smooth muscles which are present in the, in the broad ligament. So they are known as true. But the other one is pseudo or the false. What happens in that? The fibroid or the myoma grows in the, on the wall of the uterus. And then it goes on the side. It, double, it goes, grows on the side. So that is basically the origin is from the uterus, not in the broad ligament. So they are known as false or pseudo um, type of broad ligament and, or um, uh, myomas. And if it de novo, this originates in the uh, broad ligament, they are known as true broad ligament myomas. 
we will show you some diagrams so what you are seeing here is the uterus and the cervix and vagina let me see so this is the uterus as you can see here this is the fibroid in the wall of the uterus so this is intramural fibroid which i was mentioning the second if this is towards the endometrium inside towards the cavity then this is known as submucous and if it is towards the surface towards the serosa this is known as subsurface suppose like this is is submucosal and if suppose it develops it develops the pedicle okay so this is pedunculated fibroid this is towards the inside the cavity so this is known as intracavitary pedunculated fibroid the same thing can happen on the surface also so this is a pedunculated subserosal fibroid what is this as you see this is a broad ligament myoma what you are seeing here is a broad ligament myoma and i was telling there are two types one is a true other is a false or pseudo the true one this is the true true one see this has the origin is in the broad ligament this is what you are seeing is a broad ligament in this broad ligament if it develops so it is true but if you see this one here it is developed from the musculature it is developed from the from the musculature of the uterus okay and from there it has gone on the side so this is not it has not originated from the broad ligament so this is known as false or pseudo broad ligament myoma so how you are going to differentiate it see if there is a on the side of the uterus is a ureter on the side is the ureter so if it has developed from the broad ligament so this ureter will be on the medial side of the myoma but if it has developed from the musculature it will push the ureter on the side you can see here the ureter is on the lateral side of the tube so in that way you can make out whether this is a false or true broad ligament myoma this is something known as parasitic fibroid or wandering fibroid so what is that so sometimes rarely what happens this pedunculated fibroid subserosa which is outside that gets blood supply from say omentum or so from the uh, bowel and start taking the supply from there and it gets cut off from the uterus the pedicle that is cut off so it goes and start taking supply from the other structure other than the uterus so those are known as parasitic fibroid or wandering fibroid so as i mentioned if you see the ca fibroid how it looks like if you see it will be either round or oval and if you touch it it is firm and on the surface there is a pseudo capsule which is because of the compression of the surrounding tissue if you cut it it has got a whole appearance or concentric appearance this is a white color normally they are white color and shining glistening if you put this under microscope and see what you will be seeing you will seeing is a smooth muscles proliferation of the smooth muscles and they are cross crossing each other and in between there may be variable amount of fibrous tissue that's why this is known as fibroid or fibroleoma so this is how you see i'll show you some photographs see this is a what you are seeing here is the uterus this is the uterus and in this uterus see there is there is a multiple fibroids are there 
they have cut it and they are showing the so this is one fibroid is this one fibroid is this okay then see of course this is the endometrial cavity one fibroid is this this is another fibroid so multiple fibroids you can see and what they have done here they have cut the one of the fibroids see how they are this is normally white cut you can see this is the white cut and they are shining shining white cut if you touch they are formed okay and what i was telling this is a old appearance this is a concentric ah uh, you can see they are like this concentric things so this is a cut section of a gross cut section of a fibroid what is what you are seeing in this here same thing a uterus which has got a multiple fibroid that has been cut off. but here you can see is the fibroid is inside the cavity see this is a intra cavity so big a fibroid and see there are ulcerations some amount of blood is also there so this is a intra cavity sub mucosal fibroid and in the muscles also you can see there is a fibroid is there one fibroid is there one fibroid is there so this is intramural and in the center in the inside the cavity there is a sub mucosal intra cavity fibroid how they look like this is if you see it under microscope what basically cells you are seeing they are all the smooth muscles these are all smooth muscles this cross and in the white you are seeing these are in between there is a fibrous tissues so the basically this is proliferation of the smooth muscles and there is a some amount of fibrous tissue so this is what you see under microscope so there is a diagrammatic representation of the what i was telling about the location see what you are seeing here number 1 this is see the fibroid is this is the uterus this is the vagina and this is the cervix so what you are seeing is a this brown color are the fibroid so this fibroid is towards the endometrial cavity so they have they have sub classified into numbers so this is what you are seeing is is the sub mucosal fibroid same thing is here here the both are sub mucosal fibroid but here it is more in the muscles also and as well as towards the endometrium and what you are seeing here this is basically in the muscles so these are intra mural this is third four five six uh, uh third four five they are these are third and fourth are basically are intramural and this is going towards the serosa five and six so this is sub serosa so this is how uh, uh, depending upon the location you classify and sub classify second thing which i told you is about the cervical fracture what you are seeing here is the this is the urinary bladder okay and this is the uterus this is the cervix so if this myoma is present in front of the cervix so this is the anterior and here you see this is the fibroid which is present on the posterior surface of the cervix so this is a posterior cervical fibroid and this is in the center so this is known as central fibroid central cervical fibroid same thing down below what you are seeing is the broad ligament fibroid this is the true on the right side this is the true one because this is de novo originated in the broad ligament and on this left side you are seeing is a pseudo one because basically it has derived from the uterus and born in that here i was mentioning about the central see this is a central in the large central cervical 
fibroid and on the top of this is the body of the uterus what is this what you are seeing here see this is the foley's catheter which is going inside the urethra somewhere here and this is the introitus this is the speculum what you are seeing and once you have pressed the speculum you are able to see a mass in the vagina so what is this what it can be it is either a cervical pedunculated cervical myoma or this may have arisen in the inside the cavity of the uterus and with a pedicle it has been pushed out and it is lying in the vagina so this can be either of them but this is a fibroid which is lying inside the vagina what you are seeing in this diagram which i had mentioned there central fibroid central cervical fibroid this is a see this is a huge fibroid what you are seeing and on the top of this cervical fibroid there is a small front body of the uterus so what this looks like they have given a specific word or name nomenclature to this this is this uterus is looking like this uterus is looking like a lantern which is sitting on the st paul's cathedral so in the cathedral what happens different type of cathedrals are there on the top they put a lantern so they have compared this with them they call this see this uterus as the lantern which is sitting on the st paul's cathedral so that appearance you get in this this is what is it that what i am mentioning now if you see it during surgery what has happened the surgery is being done this is the uterus body of the uterus and this is the whole large thing is the fibroid cervical fibroid so this uterus is sitting on the head of this head of this cervical fibroid so that what i was mentioning is the lantern on st paul's cathedral now as i said the fibroid they may undergo degenerative changes so what are those different type of degenerative changes one the most common is a hyaline degeneration that is the most common so what happens in that as i said there is a concentric circle sort of a thing whole appearance is there so that whole appearance is disappears in case of hyaline okay so it looks smooth and not concentric or whole appearance so this gives a homogeneous appearance what other degenerative changes can take place it becomes liquid like cystic na huh? so this if the liquefaction takes place so inside the fibroid some places will have man liquid sort of a thing, what is known as cystic degeneration third what is myxomatous degeneration if it becomes mucus like if the space is filled with mucus like uh, things then you call it myxomatous degeneration and if the fibroid becomes yellowish in color you call it is a fatty degeneration and as i said the most of the blood supply is on the surface below the capsule pseudo capsule so there the calcium may get deposited so what happens if the if it is on a long duration this caps capsule Uh, around the capsule the uh, calcification occurs what happens then if you take a x ray then you will find that there are radiopaque deposits because of the deposition of this ca calcium and that gives a honeycomb appearance in the x ray you will see the uterus with a honeycomb appearance. and another is red degeneration which normally occurs during pregnancy this is very important because number of times this will be asked in viva or you will get a short notes on this so for this i'll discuss this in subsequent slides so this is what you are seeing here is the fibroid which has been cut open if you see it carefully so this is the cervix this is the wall of the uterus and this is a large fibroid in this fibroid this portion or this portion if you see this is is 
not like this one. This has got a whole appearance, but here, if you'd like, this is more of a liquefaction, and that whole appearance is so. This is all what you are seeing is a hyaline degeneration of the fiber. So there are who are the women who are more likely to have this tumor. So it has been seen that with increasing age, that means the more they are exposed to estrogen, there are more chances of developing myomas. Or those women who had a early menarche. So if they have got an early menarche, they are more likely. Why? Because for more duration, if they have got an early menarche, so the duration of exposure to estrogen is much more. So those women are also likely to have this. Then low parity who are who have either not conceived or if they have conceived hardly one or two child. People of or women of low parity they are more likely to get this. Then obese patients, those people who have got high fat diet or if there is a history of their mother, grandmother or sisters have this fibroid, they are more likely. And in racial, it has been seen more in case of black Americans as compared to white Americans. So if somebody has got a fibroid uterus, so how they are, they can present to you. How they, how, what come with what complaints they will come to. As I mentioned in that first case, what happens that patient, what she was having, she was having excessive bleeding during the periods. So heavy menstrual bleeding. They may come, they have got a normal periods, everything is right, except that they have got excessive bleeding during the periods. So one is menorrhagia. Second is intermenstrual bleeding. What is intermenstrual? Means in between the periods, they may have bleeding. Why? Because if the fibroid is inside the cavity and the surface has got a ulcer, from the ulcer they may bleed. So intermittently also they may bleed. Normally this is painless, but some of them may have got dysmenorrhea. Why dysmenorrhea? If suppose the fibroid is inside the cavity and uterus is trying to throw this out. During the periods it is trying to throw it out. So along with the periods they may have dysmenorrhea. What is it? It is a secondary dysmenorrhea. Then, what they can complain of, they may complain of because if the size is increasing, so they may feel discomfort or pain because of the large enlarged fibroid causing pressure on the surrounding structure. Then, like this patient had come with the abdominal mass. They may come and say that they have noticed that their abdomen is increasing and they have felt that there is a mass inside. What about the urinary symptoms? Because of the pressure, the pressure may be on the bladder. If the pressure is on the bladder, so the capacity of the bladder is less now. So patient may have what? Have frequency of menstruation. And if it is pressing over the urethra, then there will be difficulty in passing urine or there will be retention of the urine in the bed. Same way, if it is going backwards and putting pressure over the rectum, then what will happen? There will be difficulty in evacuation or she may complain of constipation. The other thing, like this patient had come with, say, bowel disorder, if it is going towards the upper side, the stomach is compressed, so she may complain of dyspepsy. That means she is not able to eat properly. And lastly, subfertility. If this may, like the, our patient, she was married for seven years, still not conceiving. So they may come with the complaints of infertility or subfertility or decreased fertility. Now, as I said, they are coming with either excessive bleeding or intermenstrual bleeding. Why this thing is happening? Why there is excessive bleeding during the periods or intermittent bleeding? The reason is because the endometrial cavity, if the fibroid is coming there, so the surface area is increase. And this fibroid is being supplied by the blood vessel, so more vascularity is there, more blood is coming. So because of the more blood, more bleeding is there. Then how the bleeding normally stops, it is because of the 
contraction of the muscles and because of the fibroid uterine muscles are not able to contract properly then in case of submucosal there may be ulcer from there the intermenstrual bleeding may occur then there is a enlarged venous plexus because of the increased vascularity there is stasis and dilatation from there also excessive bleeding is occurring and as i said this happens in which cases who have got more of a estrogen so more of a estrogen and without progesterone so these patients they are likely to have an ovulation and an ovulatory bleeding is much more then because of the excessive estrogen the endometrium may be hyperplastic so more blood is happening and there is a dysregulation of angiogenic factors so what is the what happens uh, what happens if this fibroid is pressing over the urinary tract so as i said the capacity of the bladder decreases and the hemodynamic or the dynamics of the blood draw so changes so this leads to patient passing urine more frequently and if there is a pressure over the urethra then the pressure with this will cause urinary retention and difficulty in passing urine and because of the compression or the ureters the ureter may get dilated and there is a back pressure so the in the kidney also paresis will be all swell so all these things can happen if there is a pressure compression of the urinary tract in this x ray what you are saying this is a basically intravenous pyelography ivp ha huh? so what you are seeing if you see carefully see this is the ureter okay and it is draining into the bladder but on this side if you see the ureter is enlarged it's much more thick and if you see these are the pelvic calyces which are dilated because there must be a fibroid which is not seen in the x ray and which is compressing somewhere here in the ureter uh, ureter so this compression over the ureter is causing the dilatation of the ureter as well as renal pelvis so this is as a because of the back pressure now as i said in this our, the, our uh, patient she is married for 7 years still she is not conceived okay so what is why the fibroid causes this infertility or suffering there are so many causes of infertility and the fibroid may be one of the cause it is very important because if you think ki this is the ki she is not conceiving and you operate and take out the fibroid but still she may not conceive because there are so many other causes also so you must before any treatment of before you treating the patient of infertility by surgical method or other method because you think that this uh, myoma is the cause you must exclude other things otherwise what happens you operate you remove the fibroid but still patient is not conceiving this the doctor patient will come to see doctor i came to you for child but you have operated on me also but still i am not so it is very important that you must exclude the other causes of infertility before going for a surgical treatment of fibroid so why is this cause why a fibroid is causing this problem why fibroid is causing infertility the main reason there are two things so what happens if it is fibroid is in last what may it do it is not allowing the sperm to come in contact with the ova how 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 the pregnancy takes place the ova or the egg is released from the ovary and that comes inside the fallopian tube isn't it inside the fallopian tube there is a motility which propels this ova towards the endometrial cavity there are cilia are there so from outside the ova is coming and from lower down the sperms they are going through the endometrial cavity into the fallopian tube and inside the fallopian tube the fertilization takes place so if the fibroid is pressing over this tube fallopian tube then what happens the ova and the sperm can come together so this can cause 
infertility. Second thing, suppose somehow that has got fertilized there and it has come into the cavity of the uterus. Then what happens inside the uterine cavity? The implantation may be difficult. This fertilized egg requires a fertile ground to get implanted. But here, because of the fibroid, there is a problem. What problem is there? Suppose there is a submucosal factor. So what it has led to? Endometrium, which was there, that will be either thinned out or it is a profit. So the egg, which the fertilized egg or the zygote, that is not able to implant itself because of the ulcer, atrophy, thinning, or because the blood supply over the endometrium is not good. And because of the distortion of the cavity also, it cannot properly implant itself. The earlier, the, the other thing is, as we told in the first, while I was examining that, we are examining the first patient, what? We put a speculum, we are not able to see the where the cervix is. Because cervix has moved from its normal position because of the distortion of the air. So what happens in normal course of action? The sperms or the semen gets collected in the posterior fornix and the cervix is there. So this it goes up. But because of the distorted anatomy, the cervix is not lying inside the pool of semen. So they are, they are, that semen or the sperm is not able to enter the cervical cavity. So these are the basic few things which leads to subfertility or infertility in this case. So what happens? What happens if somehow the pregnancy has, is there? Even suppose the pregnancy is there, now somehow uh, it has got implanted. So what is the problem? So if the implantation is not very good, so the chances are there that it will get aborted. So, more chances of abortion is there. And as I said, if it is in the fibroid is inside the cavity, so space is also less because the fibroid is sitting there, it is distorted. So, these patients who have got a fibroid and pregnancy, they are likely to go into preterm labor. And preterm labor, these are the preterm babies, one of the main causes of perinatal mortality. Then, since the shape is distorted, the normal presentation may not be there. So, normally what happens? The most of the cases, there is a cephalic presentation. Isn't it? So, and in few cases, this is a brief presentation. So most of the time, because the anatomy is distorted, so the lie and presentation is also distorted. Then what happens? Because of the fibroid, the uterus during when she goes into labor, because of the things, uterus is not able to contract proper. So the dysfunctional labor, it may take long time and more chances that she may not de deliver. Then, if the as I said, the endometrium is thinned out, atrophic, and because of that, less vascularity in the endometrium. So the baby is not get adequate amount of nutrition. So baby may be small in triuterine growth restriction. Because dysfunctional labor, malpresentation is a more chances that she will go for a surgery rather than normal labor. And lastly, after the baby has delivered, the uterus contracts so as to prevent postpartum hemorrhage. But here in this case, what happens? Because of the fibroid, uterus is not able to contract properly. So what will happen? There is more chances of having fibroid, uh, of postpartum hemorrhage. And when this patient with fibroid, they come to you in emergency. When? Because when there is a pain due to this fibroid. So they will come to you in the casualty or in emergency. So what you should do, what you should, if you know that the patient has got a fibroid and she has come in the emergency in the pain abdomen, so what are the chances? What are the reasons this may happen if there is a pedunculated fibroid and that pedunculated fibroid gets a torsion. So the blood supply to the uterus is cut off. It is the infarction. Same way in the abdomen also because of the infarction of the fibroid, because of the torsion, they can come to you with 
acute pain abdomen in the patient. The other condition where it comes is, is it when there is a bleeding inside the fibroid. As I said, the, the blood vessels are in the below the capsule, subcapsular. If there is a blood, there is a hemorrhage there, what is known as is a red degeneration, then they can come to you. This thing happens usually in pregnancy. About this, I'll discuss in further. Lastly, one I had shown you is um, a fibroid is lying inside the vagina. So if there is a fibroid which is present inside the uterine cavity and the uterus is trying to push it down to throw it out, that time also they may come with the pain abdomen or this one. So in case of pregnancy with fibroid she comes, chances of red degeneration is there. Or if there is no pregnancy and still they come, the chances of torsion of the so I think today we'll cut down here. Rest of the thing uh, we'll take in our second part of the fibroid uterus. Since it is a very important and very common condition, I thought I'll take it in two parts. That's all for today. Thank you.